Welcome to the Data Brilliant Podcast with me, Joe Dos Santos, Chief Data Officer at Click. In this series, we explore how data is reshaping and redesigning the future of our business and personal worlds. Today, I'm joined by Malcolm Gladwell, the author of five New York Times bestsellers, which aim to make meaning out of a variety of social and scientific phenomena, whether they be biblical stories, crime epidemics, financial misdeeds, or sports controversies. He's also been named one of the most 100 influential people by Time Magazine. Welcome to Data Brilliant, Malcolm. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. So your work really seems to illuminate a lot of the work uh, of data nerds like myself and others that listen to this podcast. And I wanted to pick apart some of the themes in your writing and see if they can help us make sense of how to create what we call data literate organizations. And I'd like to start off with the concept of thin slicing. And basically, this is the idea that, you know, you don't need a million pieces of information to make a decision. Sometimes you just need the few that need to be the right ones. What can you tell us about this idea of, um, of thin slicing? So that term begins, that concept was originally applied to a fundamental human tendency um, that we make up our mind around about others much more quickly than we think. So how long does it take for you to form an impression of a doctor or a teacher? Kids form an, the impression they form of their teacher in the first you know, few minutes of the first class in September is really the impression they leave the class with. They don't update it. They're, they're, they're using a very, very, very thin slice of data to form that impression. But that idea is much more interesting and much more useful um, as it's applied to much more complicated problems. And so the question is, and this is obviously something that all of people listening have dealt with all the time, which is, what is the kind of um, most parsimonious slice of data that is necessary to make an informed, useful decision. There was a huge literature on this in medical diagnosis, which said, how much data do you need um, to gather from a parent patient before you can make an accurate diagnosis? And what we discover when we do those experiments is you probably need less data than you think. And that the error being made by the practitioner is they are probably um, over gathering data. And that's leading them down all kinds of problematic pathways. Yeah, and you tell a story about a hospital in Chicago that actually starts to illuminate the very three things that might be an indication of heart condition, for instance. And uh, I, I think in some respects, that really underscores the idea of analytics. It's about it's about finding the right three things. Once you know what they are, let's focus on that. Yeah. So the issue that comes up with this, and this is, I think, true across the board, is that what do these experiments tell us about what as human beings we're bad at? And one of the things, there's a number of things that are worth touching on, but um, a lot of the things that we're bad at have to do with being our responses to having a large amount of data. So one response is that large amounts of data make us irrationally confident in our decisions. Overconfidence is the, that's the expert's problem, right? It is the problem specific to experts. And it's as dangerous as incompetence in many ways. But the other thing is that as human beings, we're very bad at assigning the appropriate weights to data. So our default is always to assume that if we have 10 pieces of data, they are they should all be considered of roughly equal value. In the, in the situation you're describing in a hospital where you're trying to decide whether someone's having a heart attack, the weighting problem is so overwhelming, that you're better off restricting the, the, the diagnosing physician to a very small number of data points. It's just, it's not that the 10th the test is useless, is that the 10th test is of such diminishing value that all it will do in that crazy moment when you have to decide right there in the room whether the patient's having a heart attack or not, all it's going to do is lead you awry. Yeah, and I think this is a really illuminating point for people that are data professionals. I think that we try to get more and more data to people to get more and more interested people to do more and more complex math, when in fact, it's probably a handful of people that need all of the data from which to derive these few things so to make people more effective at making decisions. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do is eliminate the noise for that decision-making process. Yeah. You know, a good example of this that I happen to be personally obsessed with because I'm doing a podcast episode on this now, but I've been writing about it forever, is I've, I continue to be impressed by how wholly irrational 
the admissions process is for colleges. Mm. And one of the problems is exactly the problem we're talking about. So think about the data that a college gathers on potential undergraduates. They look at your test scores, your grades in college, your letters of recommendation, and an essay, maybe an essay that you wrote. And they more or less weight them reasonably equally. But of course, that's absurd. We now know, of course, that the essay is probably useless because more and more in elite colleges, the kids don't write their own essays. It should be weighted at close to zero. We also know, particularly for certain kinds of students and pursuing certain kinds of majors, that grades are a lot more useful than test scores, that they're telling you something. They're giving you a much richer picture of the student because they're measuring things like perseverance and mm -hmm. they're measuring, you know, did you go, did you show up for class? Did you do your homework? Were you, did you participate in class, you know, in your class discussion? Perseverance and those kinds of measures of conscientiousness are hugely predictive of your actual performance in college. So it's like, if you were to weight this properly, uh, those data streams properly, you would probably assign a weight of 10 to the grades, five to the test scores, two to the letters of recommendation. Because again, I mean, how, I mean, they're like absurd. It's like, <laughs> just like who your parents know and probably, probably zero to the, to the essay. That is not what colleges do, right? Right. right. They make this weighting mistake. Yeah. And I think that there's, um, there's something about what you just said about um, the grit factor. And you do some research on this too, this idea that people think that you're kind of good at math or bad at math, but actually there's a certain kind of person that is a perseverer and there's certain cultural elements of that. And those tend to be good predictors of, a, of, of how people succeed. And in some respects, I think um, we as data professionals are trying to um, maybe take away some of the mystique of this data analysis to show some grit in the people that are that we're talking to to kind of wallow into the data. So what have you found in terms of things that have tried to demystify data analytics and uh, help people that, that that's not their, their job nine to five to open up a little bit to be more comfortable in that kind of mathematical setting? Well, you know, an example that I've that I often think about is I've been incredibly impressed at how quickly though world of sports has um, become more sophisticated in its understanding of data in a relatively short period of time. In the space of a generation, for example, the idea that you should evaluate a basketball player by how many points they score has gone from being the single most important piece of data to a data, a bit of data that is of diminished importance. I mean, Nobody really talks about how many points you score per game in the same way. I mean, they might mention it, but it doesn't loom as large as it did just a generation ago. We now mm -hmm. understand, oh, it's misleading on so many levels. And it's not been difficult to move the sports fan base to that more sophisticated understanding of the meaning of data. It's been surprisingly easy. And I've been fascinated by that because I've, to me, it's a model of what you're talking about. A 12-year-old basketball fan's willingness now to dig into the statistical intricacies of a basketball player's performance is impressive. I mean, right. these are kids who would say, do you like math? They would say, no, I actually, <laughs> I hate math and I'm bad at math. And then you turn around and you see them talking about true shooting percentage and PER and wins above replacement and all of these, you know, <laughs> seemingly arcane statistical matters. They're totally conversant. So <laughs> it says to me that the key is finding is, is motivational. It's not intellectual. It's not that this is a cognitive burden. It's just getting people to see how much, how useful and how fun right. it is to see the world through, the, world through this lens. Well, one of the things that you have uh, made so easy in the, the explanation of these things is through storytelling, right? So, and I think that what we're, what we're looking at is a generation of corporations that need to be equally good at that same kind of storytelling, right? So telling the story about a carbon footprint through marketing, through narratives, through explanation. Um, what kind of tips could you give a company around how to tell a story in a meaningful way that conveys what they're looking to do, that can, can kind of pull at the heartstrings, that can tell a story in a way that people can be willing to hear the math? Yeah. Well, I think here's another example. I was on a uh, panel, listening to a panel not long ago, and one of the panelists was the CEO of United Airlines. 
and he explained this thing that they do. You know how you're you're running to make a connecting flight and you get there with five minutes to spare and they won't let you on the plane. Mm -hmm. The gate agent says, sorry, you're too late. <laughs> Been Close there. Closed. And you say, but wait, it's not leaving for another five minutes. And they say, sorry, that's the rule, right? And everyone's unhappy. And so the head of United Airlines said, this is such a source of unhappiness, both in customers and gate agents, that I want to try and fix it. And what he realized was it's a data problem. And the data problem is the reason you close the door is you don't want to be late. And the reason you don't want to be, you don't, you want to take off on time is you assume that any delay in leaving the airport translates into a delay in landing. And he realized, actually, that's an assumption that can be evaluated through the use of AI, that there's a ton of variables that determine whether a plane can make up lost time in flight. We can actually predict which flights could safely leave five minutes later and still land on time. Right? We know all the variables. All we need is a system to analyze that data at the at the gate, and the gate agent can look at that data and decide, oh, in this case, it's actually fine if I let you on the flight with two minutes to go, because we happen to be one of those cases of a flight that can make up lost time on the way to Cleveland or wherever you're going, right? Now, that's a that's two things. That is a story of incredible relevance. When I told you that story, you said been there, right? We've all been there, right? That's a story all of us are interested in. And it's a data story, right? It's, that's right. It's in, in, that's the kind of, to my, I listened to it and I said, I, I said to him, I was the moderator of the panel, I said to the CEO, I said, you have to tell that story, right? <laughs> you, you, they're telling it internally because it makes their gate agents happy. I was like, you have to tell travelers that story. It's, such a great story and it's it's about it's about intelligent use of data and about and it's making us understand as 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 passengers on that the airlines are being sophisticated they're doing their job right mm. then they're using they're bringing all this incredible sophistication they have to bear on a problem that affects me when i'm racing through the airport trying to make my connecting flight um and i think they i think that the challenge is to look for cases like that where you have something that's of real relevance to your customers and you can you can you can weave together this you know data plus an outcome that they're interested in. Totally. So I'm about to engage in what maybe data people might consider heresy. Um, but is there a time when we would want to rely on people's gut instincts to make decisions, or is there a way to complement those gut instincts with data? When what are good situations where we would want to trust these things that we're feeling inside? I'm only interested in the gut instincts of um, of experts, first of all. Mm. So that's my first thing is, if we're talking about an area where you have real expertise, then sure. Um, am I interested in Warren Buffett meets with the CEO of a company he's thinking of investi investing in, and he has a bad feeling in his stomach when he leaves? Am I interested in that bad feeling? Yes, I am. Mm. Um, if I meet with that CEO and have a bad feeling, am I interested in that bad feeling? No, I'm not my gut feelings are useless about that kind of stuff. Um, if I, but if I read a, if someone gives me an article to read that they're working on and I read it and I have a little tingly feeling at the end, totally listen to that. That's my job, mm. right? I've been doing right. it for 40 years. Um, so that's first thing. Um, second thing is, am I interested in augmenting that gut feeling in some way I absolutely am. So my next question would be, is there a way I can um, clarify the experience um, to make the gut feeling more useful? Um, so, you know, to go back to the example of many investors I've talked to talk about how they don't, they actually don't like to meet the CEO of the company they're investing in. It's a way of, for them to clarify the data stream, to remove, because me, you know, what the person looks like and sounds like and how charming they are is ir irrelevant. So they say, those are data streams that just don't help me. So let's just not use them. Let's talk on the phone. Um, and I like that. I, so they're, you know, they're, they're, they're starting with an understanding of what the variables are that they're interested in. And then they are conditioning the experience to make sure that the relevant data is the data that is, um, that is considered or weighted the most heavily. So that's, that's, that's what I like. 
Yeah, and I think in many of your writing, you make a distinction between the analysis of a thing and the analysis of a person. I like this concept that you introduced that you call asymmetric insight, where you believe you know more about the person in front of you easily, but you believe yourself you are a mystery that needs to be, you know, years years of discovery would only scratch the surface of my complexity. Yeah. Um, and and you have great stories about this. I think you said that you hired your assistant after like one lunch meeting, you know, gut instincts. And we have these gut instincts about people, um, but they also sometimes take us astray, right? They yeah. take us into situations with uh, police stops and different kinds of things that create this kind of asymmetry. So what, what's your thinking around kind of how we make decisions around people and and uh, in a professional context, in a personal context, and uh, what what's the mix of kind of gut instinct and uh, data that we can use? Yeah, so the, the problem, the asymmetry problem is that we are way overconfident in our, um, in our ability to read other people. So I will say, you know, Joe, do you understand, after having this conversation with me, do you understand who I am, my deepest motivations? And I would say, no, of course not. You, we just met. There's no way. But if you ask me, oh, do you understand Joe? I would say, yeah, I have a sense of who he is. Yeah, I feel confident. Blah, blah, blah. That's the mistake we make as human beings. We correctly believe that human, when it comes to ourselves, the human beings are difficult to read and complicated and contradictory and all these kinds of things. But we have this, we're so willing to jump to conclusions about others that we think others are an open book. And this problem shows up in a variety of different settings. But, you know, there are situations, you know, my last book, Talking to Strangers, was structured around a, um, you know, this incredibly tragic police stop. Uh, one of the signature cases in from a couple of summers ago of this woman named Sandra Bland, who's stopped for no reason by a police officer. And it got me into this whole question of policing, which is really problematic because for this very reason that a, a police officer, when a police officer encounters someone on the street, the biggest problem they face is the asymmetrical insight problem. They have to make a very quick decision about whether this person is dangerous, possibly criminal, uh, or harmless, right? And they don't really have the time or the data to make a, a reasoned and intelligent prediction about which of those categories the person falls into. That's the fundamental problem of policing, right? Really difficult problem to solve. How do you do that? And what's happening now, and one of the things that I'm very excited about in the world of policing is that we can use data to help the police officer in that very problematic moment. Um, and we can also use training to help the police officer in that problematic moment. Training can help the police officer slow down when you look at all of these cases of problematic police shootings, problematic police stops, whatever, they're all cases where everything's happening really quickly. Not all, but mo many of them are. So one thing we can do is try and slow them down. The other thing we can do is we can use data to make sure that uh, this kind of proactive policing is confined to areas where there are statistically a lot of criminals. Right? And that sounds like a kind of weird thing to say, but it turns out that when you do statistical analysis of where crimes occur, what you discover is that crimes occur in an incredibly predictable number of places. And they also, uh, there are certain places where an enormous, a very small number of places where an enormous number of crimes happen. And the balance of any community is actually, even communities that are considered to be at high risk are relatively crime-free. So if you can inform police officers about where the criminality is, you can reduce the costs of these kinds of mistakes. And that is incredibly encouraging movement in, uh, in, in law enforcement to try and inform, to give the police officer more tools at his or her disposal to make intelligent decisions. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about your new book, which, uh, as we're recording, came out just last week called The Bomber Mafia. And it really has, as uh, if I can call them hero and anti-hero, <laughs> two characters, uh, Haywood Hansel and Curtis LeMay, who are very significant figures in, uh, in World War II. Well, would you mind introducing us to these two gentlemen? Yes. So Haywood Hansel is the, the sort of spiritual leader of a group that called themselves the Bomber Mafia. And they were 
a group of people who were obsessed with the te- the new technology of bombing and what it could mean for warfare. And Hansel is a kind of from a long southern military family. He had ancestors who fought in the Revolutionary War, who fought as generals in the Confederate War, and he is this kind of like you know, he's wrote poetry. He would sing Broadway show tunes to his men as he flew back from bombing missions over Europe. He was, his favorite book is Don Quixote. He identifies with the knight who tilts at windmills. He's just this kind of dreamer who inspires this group of men, and they're all men in the 30s in Alabama, with this notion that, wait a minute, if we have bombers that can fly six miles in the air at 250 miles an hour, and if we can drop bombs with precision, if we could conquer the physics problem of how to drop a bomb and have it hit its target, then we've changed warfare forever. His 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 antagonist is a man named Curtis LeMay, who is in every way the opposite of Curtis of, of Haywood Hansel. LeMay is this kind of from the streets of Columbus. He's a poor kid who is sell, entirely self-made and who is the furthest thing from a romantic. He is this hard-bitten realist who never takes his cigar out of his mouth. And he will he listens to this dream of Haywood Hansel and he says that's nonsense. That is worse than nonsense. That is you guys are are pursuing an idea that will uh that will lead to defeat in the war against the Germans and the Japanese. And these two guys know each other, can't stand each other, vie for the same jobs, and finally have a showdown um in Guam in January nineteen forty five. And my book is about that story, you know, these two people with two very different visions and what happens when they come into conflict. Yeah. And I think the thing that resonated with me about this is that this is, they almost feel like an angel and devil on your shoulder. And at some points I wasn't quite sure who the angel was and who the devil was. And I think you purposefully play it that way. Um, uh, but the idea that we both want to have this idea of the vision, that the truth, the kind of a priori thing that we want to go do, at the same time, we have to get practical results. Uh, we have to kind of make good on what's in front of us. Um, and so at the end of the uh, book, you conclude, you know, there's um, LeMay won the battle, Hansel won the war. Um, explain what you mean by that. Like, how how do these things? How do we balance these different components of a personality as as data leaders, making decisions mm-hmm. based on both a, a blending of strategy and tactics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there. The story is unusual in that you know each of these two men represent, as you say, a very very different model of um, of leadership and of vision that Hansel is someone who is in love with um, technology and what mm-hmm. technology can do to transform war. And he is, um, as so many technological innovators and obsessives are, um, he assumes that technolo- the promise of technology can be realized far more quickly than uh, it actually can. The bottom off here are people who you know, they're obsessed with this little analog computer called the Norden bombsite, an analog computer that purports to have solved the physics problem of dropping a bomb with accuracy. He went in like 25 different variables into this thing, various pulleys and knobs and buttons and gyroscopes. And it, it instructs the bombardier on a bomber when to release the, its payload. And right. the bottom off, you say, oh, okay, we've solved this problem of how to drop a bomb accurately, that means we can fight war in a totally different way. We no longer need to bomb civilians. We no longer need to kill hundreds of thousands of people in the course of prosecuting a war. And the problem is, of course, that it doesn't work in the real world the way it works in a, mm-hmm. you know, in a test or in, un, under perfect conditions. And so they struggle over the course of the Second World War to make this vision real, and they fail. But of course, fast forward 50 years, and that's exactly what we have today. Now we we actually can drop bombs with almost perfect accuracy. Um, when I say almost, actually, we can drop bombs with perfect accuracy. I mean, mm-hmm. we can, you know, we could, there's an apple tree outside my window. The 
U.S. Air Force could absolutely take out that apple tree and leave ab- everything around it standing, right? That's how good we are now. So the the general direction that the bomber mafia was headed in in, in the 1940s um, was the right one. They realized that this is where, you know, that in complicated fields, you can use technology and um, and data to solve this to, to zero in on your target more accurately, right? They were right. They just weren't right in, a, yet. in within yet, right? And LeMay was someone who was completely uninterested in that kind of of uh, grand vision. He was the the opposite of a visionary. He was a ruthless realist. He was like, tell me what works right now. That's all I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. And the best leaders, as you say, are people who I think can kind of hold those two contradictory ideas in their head simultaneously, who understand what the promise of technology is, but are also willing to be patient and to be realists about when it's going to be useful, not just if it's going to be useful. So they're, you know, they're, the book is models this, these two approaches, but, you know, I do in, in a perfect world, we would be able to embody them both, I think. So, Malcolm, in terms of putting these two personas together, one of the people who seems to be a hero of yours is Bernadine Healy of the NAH. Uh, she has a great story about trying to take on Congress and big parties to make to affect change for the NAH. I wonder if you can share her story with our listeners. Yeah, so she's a she's one of my heroes. I knew her. She died sadly prematurely of cancer, but she was the head of the NIH in a very very tumultuous time in that in that um, institution's history. And I think you're right. She was the rare kind of leader who could do those, be two things. She could be that kind of idealistic um, dreamer who could give people a vision. I mean, she was also a ruthless pragmatist. And I give you one thing that I didn't talk about much in that you're referring to an episode of my podcast, Revisionist History, where I talk about her. She did something when she was the head of NAH. She's she launched, I've forgotten what it was called, but something like the Women's Health Project. But she had observed that uh, clinical trials of new treatments were overwhelmingly done on men. Then we simply extrapolated from those results to women. And she said, not in a kind of ideological way, but in a as someone who was immersed in the data, she was a cardiologist. She was like, well, I don't, I think the differences between when and women are such that we're making a mistake here that the you can't simply extrapolate from one gender to the other. We, we probably need to start collecting data separately with women, particularly pregnant women. And so she launched this incredibly ambitious initiative at NIH to, to overcome generations of neglect of data gathering among women. And that data has, you know, resulted in a whole series of insights into women's health that have been enormously useful over the last, uh, she spent, I can't remember, but it was, she talked Congress into authorizing um, this. It was a, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars here. We're not, this is not a trivial thing. I mean, hmm. these kinds of, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people tracked for years and years and years, a massive infrastructure, which is all driven by um, her kind of um, uh, incredibly clear eyed, uh, dedication to data. She was like, we, we just can't be making assumptions anymore. Why? Let's, let's, let's get the, and she set a model, I think, that I think is a really important one, particularly in government, which says, don't make decisions without gathering all your data carefully first. Um, and th- that was a, that's a really, you know, that may be commonplace in, in industry. It's a harder sell in government when, you have to get Congress to pay for your data gathering, right? And she managed to do that. And I've always put taken my hat off for her. At the same time, she was someone who became convinced that scientists in NIH were being unfairly singled out on false charges of fraud. And she led a moral crusade to defend them. And so like she could do that too. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. she'd get you she get you either way. <laughs> so she was <laughs> an extraordinary, really extraordinary figure who I've 
your keynote speech at ClickWorld was really focused on the idea of data being objective and fair. I wonder if you could share a little bit of your thoughts about uh, data fairness and how data is being used in enterprises today. I was interested in this idea that um, the people like yourself and people at Click who are um, data professionals have a lot to teach the rest of us about how to approach complex problems. And they can, in particular, they can teach us about what questions we need to be asking when we engage in the process of gathering data. So I've, you know, I talked a lot of, in that talk about education and about um, how I think in the world of education, we're not terribly sophisticated um, in the way we use data and with devastating results with fact. And then that means we make a series of really dumb decisions and squander a lot of resources and a lot of human talent. Um, and it, you know, so it's, it was more, it's like a, I think sometimes that um, we forget that um, before you make decisions based on data, you need to, when I say we, I don't mean people in your world. I mean, people in the non data professional world forget that there is an enormous amount of preparation that has to take place before analysis begins. Um, you know, questions about ideology and fairness and all those kinds of things. What was, what was motivating the data collection? You know, the teacher evaluation, which has become this incredibly important thing in the public school system in this country, is something that where if you examine it with a kind of clear-eyed data analyst's perspective, it's the most nonsense. I mean, it's just, and it's because the people who have launched it have had all the wrong assumptions. They've assumed that teaching is something that can be measured. Um, it's not that good teaching can't be measured. They assume that good teaching could be measured in isolation, that you could isolate the teacher and assign the teacher a kind of value that expressed the quality of their teaching. And in fact, that is the wrong conceptual understanding of teaching, that what teaching really is, is an interaction between a teacher and a student. And unless you know what student the teacher is interacting with, you can't evaluate the teacher's performance, right? So we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in this country evaluating teachers mm -hmm. and using that data to guide how we, who we hire, how we promote, how we pay, who we fire, on and on and on. And much of that effort has been not useless, but wasted because we started with the wrong assumption. We didn't understand what we were measuring, right? And and sometimes you're not even in the right ballpark of measurement. I think in Outliers, you suggest that the number one predictor of how well a student's going to do is the number of days they're in the classroom and that there's actually material attrition in a student's performance over the summer. So we're, we're trying to hold the teachers accountable for something that's actually happening during the summer months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also what's weird, the the, the really interesting thing about looking at data on teaching is that what you quickly discover is if even the phrase so-and-so is a good teacher is of limited meaning because it turns out that great teachers are always great teachers um, with respect to certain kinds of students. So there are certain teachers, for example, who are really, really, really good with students who are struggling. And there are certain teachers who are terrible with struggling students, but amazing with gifted students. So all we can say is so-and-so is a really good teacher of gifted students, which is an incredibly useful thing to know about that person, right? Because we can then say, we can go to that teacher and we can say, look, we have your career path for you. And if you would like to teach other kinds of students, we can, let's work with you and let's retrain you and let's refocus you. But right now we know exactly where you'll shine. Now we have a bit of data that's useful, right? Wow, is that useful, right? Uh, we can... To go to the, and it's, you know, we can go to the teacher who's teaching calculus. And we can say, actually, you shouldn't be teaching calculus. You should be teaching, <laughs> you know, uh, algebra to ninth graders. That's where, that's what you're great at. That's and the teacher might spot. say, yeah, that's your sweet spot, right? There we have data. You know, so it's like the idea that, you know, that's so exciting, that insight, right? It's a data insight, but it begins with, an, a, with a correct assumption about what teaching is. And I think so often we don't begin with the correct, we don't take the time to say, wait a minute, before we gather any data, 
what is it that we're measuring, right? Perfect. So as we wrap up this conversation, um, I wonder if you could highlight a few things that you think are truly exciting out there that are changing the world with respect to data and analytics. I know you have a front row seat at a lot of them. It might be hard to choose. Yeah. I um, I got involved. A friend of mine uh, invited me to be on the board of this little data-driven, it's called Sergo. It's very small. like, um, And it's a nonprofit NGO that solves data problems, typically in the third world. Um, and with a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data analysis. And they're interested in things like, I have a new treatment for a childhood disease in uh, Uttar Pradesh in India, and I can't convince the mothers to use it. Why? Or I have a problem with drug-resistant tuberculosis because people aren't taking their medicine. What do I have to do to get them to take their medicine? And those are the kind of number of lives that hang in the balance of those two problems. Enormous, enormous, right? And we've been frustrated for a long time in trying to solve the problem. Why doesn't the mother want to use the medication, right? And what they're going in and they're saying, we've been trying to answer that question quantitatively only or qualitatively only. And you can't do that. You got to do qualitative and quantitative. And you have to, we've been trying to answer that question from afar. Can't do it. You got to go to Uttar Pradesh and you got to sit down with these people and talk to them. And you have to understand the dynamic of the entire community. And you got to combine that with a big data set. And then you got to come up with a set of recommendations and then you have to implement them. That's super exciting to me. I love this idea of real world problems, uh, qualitative plus quantitative and you know, and you know, this little group, Sergo, you know, they're getting, they're hiring like the best and the brightest kids out of these data analysis programs. What a great story. So how can our listeners find more Malcolm Gladwell? Well, they can go to bombermafia.com and download the audiobook, um, which is uh, my, my latest work. And my new episode of my new season of Revisionist History starts June 27th. 10, 10 new episodes, um, including a really fun two-part thing, which is all about data, where I got some status, some kids, some students at Reed College to hack the U.S. News College Ranking algorithm. Terrific. Tune in for more information. Uh, well, Malcolm, it's been a real pleasure having you. Really, thank you for coming on, on to uh, Data Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. It's been really fun. Malcolm Gladwell reminds us to balance strategy and pragmatism. Be bold and tell stories that affect change, and help people to be excited about data and analytics as a 12-year-old watching an NBA basketball game. Thank you for listening to this episode of Data Brilliant, brought to you by Click and hosted by me, Joe Dos Santos. 